The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled How I Think, How I Treat. Cardiology-focused perspectives on using SGLT2 inhibitors to optimize outcomes in patients with heart failure. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash EYZ 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Great. Well, welcome uh, to this session. Thank you very much for joining us this uh, evening. The session is titled how I think, how I treat cardiology-focused perspective on using SGLT2 inhibitors to optimize outcomes in patients with heart failure. We have a good panel here to think about uh, how to use SGLT2 inhibitors from both a cardiovascular and from an endocrine perspective. I'm Javed Butler. I'm a cardiologist uh, and uh, uh, president of the Baylor Scott White Research Institute in Dallas, Texas. I have two of my really respected colleagues with me, Dr. Alice Chang, who's an endocrinologist, uh, from Toronto, uh, so we can ask her all the difficult questions at the end. And I have Dr. Vaduganathan from Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, who is a cardiologist, clinical trialist, interested both in heart failure and in cardiometabolic diseases. So the way the program has been uh, divided, there will be two initial presentations by Dr. Vaduganathan. He'll talk a little bit about general aspects of SGLT2 inhibitor guidelines, some data in diabetes, and some data overall, big picture, uh, uh, for heart failure. Uh, then we'll go specifically into the details of the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction trials. Uh, and then I will discuss both uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction trials and acute heart failure uh, uh, trials. Uh, and then Dr. Cheng will uh, wrap up the session talking about practical management and how to incorporate these therapies, and especially uh, considering what, what cardiology audience uh, who may still have some reservation that these are diabetes drugs, uh, how to safely use them, when to be concerned, when not to be concerned. So with that, Dr. Vaduganan, I'll hand it to you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. Thank you all for joining us uh, during this late evening hour. And uh, I think all of you probably embrace and uh, recognize that the SGLT2 inhibitors have represented perhaps the most important advancement in the last decade and has also been substantiated and evaluated in the largest uh, uh, clinical trial experience across disciplines of really any therapeutic product, even in heart failure. And the SGLT2 inhibitors have really taken a meandering course to heart failure, and of course was initially developed as a therapeutic for type 2 diabetes, and indeed is strongly recommended in the management of type 2 diabetes, especially in those individuals who have uh, evidence of heart failure or who are at high risk for heart failure, including uh, other aspects like ASCVD and CKD. These are uh, risk markers that identify treatment candidates with type 2 diabetes who may particularly benefit from an SGLT2 inhibitor. And this is endorsed in the most recent ADA 2022 guidelines. But all of you here are to, uh, to um, discuss and learn about the management of heart failure. And so we'll really evaluate this landscape uh, first to give you a broader view of the current indications today of SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and this is based on US FDA labeling. I'll start on the far right. Um, this is type 2 diabetes. We have four therapies. All, um, uh, all four therapies are approved for use for the management of glycemia in type 2 diabetes. Sodiclofosin, the fifth compound listed, is an investigational compound, is still undergoing regulatory review. Um, We'll move next to chronic kidney disease. We have two labels. Canagliflozin is recommended in patients with diabetic kidney disease, and then dapagliflozin is recommended in chronic kidney disease irrespective of type 2 diabetes status. Um, and importantly, EMPA kidney, which was the pivotal trial that evaluated CKD outcomes, um, uh, was read out at ASN Kidney Week just a couple of days ago. And so we anticipate that will also be under regulatory review. Next, we'll move to the ASCVD group. These trials are still underway of dedicated trials evaluating patient populations after myocardial infarction. However, three of the drugs, 
CANA, DAPA, and EMPA are all indicated for cardiovascular risk reduction in people with type 2 diabetes. Um, and then finally, the reason we're here is to discuss heart failure. Um, and really only two drugs, DAPA and EMPA, are indicated for the management and treatment of patients with established heart failure. DAPA and EMPA uh, both are indicated in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and pagliflozin is recommended irrespective of ejection fraction for all patients with heart failure. And the dapagliflozin data from the DELIVER trial is under regulatory review to see if a similar label will be afforded uh, for that drug. So this kind of gives you some context of the distribution of really six important trials that have been conducted uh, in, uh, of the SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure populations. The top two trials here, um, DAPA-HF and EMPA-reduced sister trials evaluating dapagliflozin and empagliflozin in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, irrespective of diabetes status. EMPA-preserved and DELIVER, again, sister trials evaluating these two compounds in preserved ejection fraction populations. And then soloist worsening heart failure, this was a trial that was unfortunately stopped early due to loss of funding and a, a, attained a smaller sample size, but still 1,200 patients, another positive trial. Um, Solus worsening heart failure evaluated sodagliflozin in patients with uh, acute heart failure. This is after worsening heart failure event and was restricted to patients with type 2 diabetes. And then finally, EMPULSE, a smaller trial of about 530 individuals. This is uh, the evaluation of empagliflozin in acute heart failure. So uh, really a, uh, a nice spread of the, not only across heart failure phenotypes, but also across diabetes status. And while we started this journey in diabetes, this is firmly now established as a drug across cardiorenal metabolism and is strongly indicated in patients with heart failure, irrespective of diabetes status. So unfortunately today, we have uh, a really a, a major challenge in terms of implementation, despite the really tremendous advancement in terms of medical therapies, we've had time after time in terms of clinical registries as well as real-world evidence, we've seen underutilization of effective guideline-directed medical therapies. These are data from the Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Registry, the largest ongoing prospective U.S. registry of heart failure patients. You could see these are patients who are eligible for an SGLT2 inhibitor at the time of hospitalization for heart failure. You can see even those who are eligible for addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor are undertreated based on background medical therapies, very low utilization of secubitril valsartan. Even established generic therapies like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, are used at 80% or below. And importantly, large gaps in the MRA, spironolactone and aplerinone. So important gaps in medical therapies, even in the context of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where we have a substantial, substantial level of evidence. And that is to say that each of these therapies, the four therapies now strongly recommended in the use, in the management of heart failure reduced EF, have not only additive potential, but really substantial gains in, um, uh, in risk reduction. So to orient you here, the light blue is the mortality risk at two years. You could see no therapy all the way to cumulative or four drug therapy. And then the darker blue is the actual risk reductions afforded by each individual compound. And you could see that as you move to the right, and this is not a particular sequence, this is just a, for illustrative purposes, but as you move to the right, you can see that the overall risk moves from 35% absolute risk to a cumulative with four drug therapy, inclusive an SCL2 inhibitor, of only 10%, with about a, over 70% reduction in cumulative risk. So really um, a real opportunity to modify disease course. This is now presented in a different way with number needed to treat, sometimes um, uh, effective in terms of context. You can see here in just three years, the number needed to treat um, to prevent one uh, death is 22 patients, and this is in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It's really substantial. Most of us see 22 patients in clinic um, in a given day, and it's a real opportunity to save a life over just a short-term horizon.
The clinical practice guidelines and heart failure have also rapidly adopted, embraced this strategy of SGLT2 inhibition. This is really important. The AHA, ACC, HFSA guidelines have, have taken a kind of journey perspective, looking at each of the time points in care in which we evaluate patients for heart failure, those at risk for heart failure, early stage heart failure, and those then with overt, clinically overt heart failure, stage C heart failure. And you can see at each of these different intervals, SGLT2 inhibitors are now incorporated as a strong level of evidence. They're recommended in those at risk for development of heart failure, that is type 2 diabetes with established cardiovascular disease, stage A and B heart failure there. They're recommended for all patients as a class one recommendation for reduced EF, and then in mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction, this was prior to the, uh, the readout of the DELIVER trial, you could see a strong recommendation, a 2A recommendation, that beneficial for most patients should be strongly considered um, in patients at higher ejection fraction. So we'll see that those guidelines will likely be upgraded after, now that we have two trials again in that, this population. The ESC heart failure guidelines are also very concordant about strong recommendations in this context. So prevention of heart failure and treatment of heart failure is strongly uh, endorsed by this treat, uh, these guidelines. So you can see prevention is a 1A recommendation. Treatment in reduced EF is a 1A recommendation. And again, um, in preserved ejection fraction, there's an implicit recommendation in type 2 diabetes that this is a beneficial for patients with coexisting heart failure, and we'll again see that once these, uh, uh, these guidelines also are updated with the most recent readout of the HEPPEF trials. So I'm not going to go into the individual differences and similarities between these gu guidelines, but I think it's a special moment that just within one year, we've seen updates in two of the largest guidelines across globally that have now formed consistency of embracing SGLT2 inhibition as a core component of quadruple therapy, especially in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Similarly, adjacent disciplines and colleagues in uh, nephrology and diabetes have similarly embraced the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, especially at those at these at-risk intersections. Here you can see the KDGO guidelines that were very recently updated. Um, these are recommendations for patients with chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes that overlap, that commonly exist. You can see that this kind of similar type of pillar approach, all patients should be uh, optimized with lifestyle management, glycemic control, blood pressure control, lipid management. Then you can see really foundational therapy with SGLT2 inhibitors and uh, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system blockade as really a core component for most individuals. And those are especially those um, uh, who are at risk for high risk of progression of kidney disease. So we'll take a slight sidestep in terms of mechanisms, and I just want to draw the distinction that to date, most of those foundational elements of medical therapies in heart failure have targeted really one axis, and that is neuro the neurohormonal system. And that system has been most active in those with reduced ejection fraction and less so in those with higher ejection fractions. And you can see that there often, most patients with heart failure have a similar journey. There's often some acute insult uh, still today, the most frequent pathway towards heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is a myocardial infarction. And after that acute response, there's often a maladaptive response uh, intensified by uh, the renin-angiotensin system. And so most of these therapies that have formed the foundation for HEFREF management target that maladaptive response. The SGLT2 inhibitors take a completely new approach. And um, I, re I recall vividly uh, in 2019, uh, when uh, John McMurray was presenting the DAPA-HF results, there was a resounding uh, applause that this was a new approach to managing heart failure because it was really a, a dramatic shift in how we thought about heart failure. And in fact, um, I, we don't have time, unfortunately, to cover the myriad of mechanisms. And I, it, would, it would be false to say that I know the exact mechanism that drives these benefits, but you can see that there are multi-system benefits on the circulation, heart, uh, 
kidney that are critically important. And while these transporters predominantly are expressed in the proximal tubule of the kidney, there are clearly systemic responses that are benefited in these patients and uh, that in total allow for cardiorenal protection. And these mechanisms exist across the ejection fraction spectrum, so really uh, help um, promote the notion that these drugs are therapies for all heart failure, irrespective of EF. So let's quickly dive into the heart failure with reduced EF data, and then uh, Dr. Butler will uh, uh, deep dive into the preserved EF and acute heart failure populations. So reduced EF, we started, there were two pivotal trials, DAPA-HF and Emperor reduced and I want to take us through, there's a lot of details on this slide, both trials are very, very similarly designed, executed, and conducted. These trials were trials of adults with heart failure with an injection fraction less than or equal to 40% that's concordant with the clinical practice guidelines of what HEFREF is defined by. These are symptomatic patients. And with elevated natriuretic peptide levels, these are global trials conducted over 20 countries. And you can see that the majority of patients in this trial were patients without diabetes, about 60%. Um, importantly, patients who had type 1 diabetes, patients with significant um, kidney uh, uh, dysfunction, including EGFR less than 30 and DAP-HF, um, uh, and those acutely hospitalized for heart failure were excluded from the trial. Uh, patients uh, were randomized to dapagliflozin at a fixed dose, 10 milligrams once daily, uh, without a need for titration, compared with matching placebo and followed for a median of 18 months. These are event-driven trials, and the endpoints are slightly different. The primary endpoint for DAP-HF was um, hospitalization for heart failure, an urgent heart failure event that's needing urgent attention in an ambulatory care setting, or a cardiovascular death. Emperor reduced almost identical in terms of its uh, trial design. Again, a multi-center global trial evaluating the same HEFREF population. Again, a 50% percent split in terms of type 2 diabetes status. Um, uh, Emperor reduced went down to a lower GFR uh, criteria, so EGFR of less than 20 were excluded. And um, uh, again, not evaluating the acute state. These are really patients who are stabilized in ambulatory care. And patients were randomized to EMPA, again, at a fixed dose of 10 milligrams once daily versus placebo, and followed for a median of 20 months. Here, the endpoint was either a hospitalization for heart failure or a cardiovascular death. So two independent trials conducted over in the contemporary era on excellent background medical therapy and remarkably, remarkably, remarkably consistent data and evidence here. You could see that um, despite the slight variation in the actual endpoints studied, you could see the risk reductions of about a 25% risk reduction in the primary endpoint was seen in both clinical trials uh, in these global contexts with um, these two compounds. And here is the, some of the other endpoints. This is all-cause mortality. Uh, in the DAP-HF trial, all-cause mortality was a secondary endpoint um, due to the hierarchical nature of um, uh, statistical testing. This uh, could not be formally uh, uh, called statistically significant, but it is nominally so. And so there's about a 17% reduction in all-cause mortality with dapagliflozin. There in Emperor Reduced, you can see there was about an 8% reduction that was not statistically significant. For hospitalization for heart failure, again, remarkably consistent between the two trials and substantial. So a 30% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure events, really. Um, and this number of about 30% has been consistent across every one of the trials that we've seen in type 2 diabetes, CKD, and heart failure. And so this is a drug that not only prevents heart failure, but treats patients with established heart failure. Of course, from a patient perspective, not only living longer and staying out of the hospital is important, but feeling better, functioning better is important. So this, is, uh, this was captured in both trials by a validated standardized instrument called the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. This is um, validated and, uh, by the FDA, and uh, um, here you could see the data from uh, quality of life in the DAPA-HF trial 
about 15%, just to orient you here, the top panel is those who have substantial clinically important improvements in the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. We consider that at least a five point increase, but a 10 point or 15 point increase is really substantial gains in quality of life. And then the bottom panel is a deterioration in quality of life. So who's actually feeling worse in follow up? So the top, you could see there's Dapagul flows in uh, treated patients were about 15% more likely to feel better in follow-up and about 20, 15 to 20% le uh, less likely to feel worse. So really important gains in quality of life and identically seen in the emperor reduced trial. Here you could see again the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. Again, the top panel is improvements, bottom panel is deterioration. Again, here you could see 20 to 30% improvements in clinically significant improvements in quality of life and about 20 to 30% reductions in deterioration. I want to draw your attention to that first top left panel that these improvements occur rapidly. Within three months of initiation of the drug, people can feel better. And we see as well that the effects can be seen even by clinician assessed parameters like and with relatively blunt instruments like the NYHA functional class, which generally is very difficult to move uh, from a uh, uh, day-to-day -day basis. And you could see here, just um, uh, here is just weeks uh, within of randomization. And you can see within four weeks of randomization, you see a change in functional status, a change in NYHA class assessed by the treating clinician. And there's more likelihood of improvements in NYHA and less likelihood of deterioration. Similarly, these drugs affect high cost and high burden um, uh, elements of care. Here you can see data from emperor reduced that are particularly impactful. The, this shows that empagal flows and reduced not only hospitalization, but really costly hospitalizations, those that required ICU stays, those that required inotrope use, vasodilator use, or, um, uh, or um, vasopressor use. And so you could see really marked reductions in those high cost, high burden uh, elements of care. The safety profile of these therapies is really remarkable, and um, I I'll first draw your attention, this is a, uh, a busy slide, but this first row is any serious adverse event. And we'll start with type 2 diabetes. Remarkably, um, about 50% of people in the placebo arm had an adverse event. And so this is to say that this is a high-risk group of people that frequently, unfortunately, have various issues related to their care. Remarkably, people in the SGLT2 inhibitor arm with dapagliflozin had fewer, statistically fewer, adverse events. So this is actually safer on average than a placebo pill. And in type 2 diabetes, uh, in patients without diabetes, you can see exactly the similar, um, very, uh, very comparable to placebo uh, in terms of adverse event profile. Then in the bottom, you see the individual adverse events. And again, you could see for volume depletion, kidney disease adverse events, major hypoglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis, really no variation uh, between dapagliflozin and placebo. So these drugs are remarkably safe, um, including in uh, patients without diabetes, which was really first studied in heart failure, where you can see a bunch of zeros in that bottom right. There were no adverse events in those without diabetes in uh, this trial population. So really remarkably safe, and again, substantiated in the emperor reduced trial in which the incidence of these adverse events were, while high, was actually more related to the high risk nature of this disease population and comparable to that of a placebo pill with very similar uh, individual adverse events of interest between the two uh, trial populations. So we'll revisit Morton, and just to, as a reminder, this is a 67-year-old gentleman, non-ischemic cardi uh, cardiomyopathy, blood pressures listed there, 122 over 68, LVF at 27%, and uh, NYHA class 2 symptoms. His NT-pro BNP is 1,960. Uh, this is current regimen. He's on carvedilol at a uh, sub-target dose, torsamide at 100 milligrams, uh, secutral valsartan at high dose, target dose, and a player known 50 milligrams at a target dose.
I'm going to uh, ask our esteemed colleagues here if they would have made any other adjustments in heart failure care. I mean, I can take the first stab at this one. So, uh, you know, it's, it's never a good idea to take a clinical trial average result from, you know, several thousand patients and put it to the patient which is sitting in front of you, right? So we, we are all clinicians and we will individualize the decision. So I think in some patients, if you want to cut down the dose of torsamide, if you have an elderly patient with uh, orthostatic symptoms or low blood pressure, uh, and you want to proactively do that because you do expect a certain degree of diuresis with the use of SGLT2 inhibitor, that's, I think, reasonable. But those cases will be far and few in between. By and large, uh, you don't really need to adjust any other medications. And in the clinical trial, uh, we had no algorithm, no protocol, nothing. We just go ahead and added the uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, and there was no changes. There were no changes made to uh, the dose of diuretic at the time of initiation. Now, over the long run, as their heart failure gets better, the need for diuretics go down. But at the time of initiation, the correct answer in my mind would be that no other uh, changes are needed. Yes, and I, f I fully agree. I think many of you recognize that that torsamide dose was quite high. It's torsamide 100 milligrams, and um, it is an important uh, aspect that we should reassess and follow up because as with initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors and other components of heart failure care, we may see that diuretic requirement reduce over time with improvements in cardiac function and uh, overall health status. So great. We will to uh, Dr. Butler, who is going to take over in terms of HEFPEF and acute heart failure. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so we learned a little bit about uh, cardiovascular outcomes trial. We learned a little bit about HEF-REF, and let's now move on to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So as was alluded to, these were two sort of large sister programs that were started in, uh, with ampagliflozin and with dapagliflozin, both adjacent patient populations of HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. Uh, but they had some material differences between the two, which really, really, if you put the data together, helps us look at the benefit of these therapies and all the different clinical scenarios that we might uh, be thinking of. So Emperor Preserve trial, uh, almost about 6,000 patients were randomized to empagliflozin or placebo on top of uh, standard of care comorbidity management. Uh, but if you think about it, our heart failure patients, uh, HEFREF, HEFPEF, uh, over the course of their journey for heart failure, unless and until they die of sudden cardiac death or something like that, over time they do develop chronic kidney disease. And one problem with chronic kidney disease is that there is this sort of irony that as the chronic kidney disease progresses, their risk for adverse cardiovascular events go up, but the medical therapy goes down. So this is the mismatch, which is a real problem because there is no evidence or no clinical trial data for EGFR less than 30. MRAs are actually contraindicated in less than 30, but there is plenty of data out there that shows us that patients even up to GFR of 45 and below, uh, there's a reluctance on part of the clinicians to use liberally RAS inhibitors and MRA because of the effect on creatinine and whatnot. So as the risk goes up, the treatment uh, uh, intensity goes down, uh, and we don't really have evidence base also. So with these uh, drugs, uh, we went uh, with Emperor Redu uh, with Emperor Preserved and Emperor Reduced both uh, down to an EGFR of 20. Not only that, that the inclusion was uh, to EGFR of 20. In the trial, once SGLT2 inhibitor are started, remember like SGLT2 inhibitor, very much like ACE inhibitors, uh, there is an initial EGFR dip or initial bump in creatinine, which is related to intraglomerular hemodynamic changes. This has nothing to do with any glomerular or tubular damage or anything like that. You stop ACE inhibitors or you stop an SGLT2 inhibitor, and that initial dip in the EGFR reverses. So we were expecting that. So once you initiate the therapy, and if the EGFR fell to less than 20, we did not touch uh, the treatment at all, and we just let it continue uh, until the person reached uh, uh, end-stage kidney disease or, or need for dialysis. So that was one sort of niche that was studied uh, in this uh, patient population uh, for which we did not have the data. Then these patients were followed uh, long-term for clinical outcomes. 
Now, the liver trial that dapagliflozin was a sister trial, uh, and in this trial, almost again the same, around 6,000 patients were uh, uh, enrolled, EGFR down to 25, uh, but it did uh, fill some other really, really important niche uh, uh, patients. So one, in emperor preserved trial, those patients that were uh, had recent hospitalizations were excluded, so you had to be about four weeks or so uh, not hospitalized. Whereas in this trial, patients were included whether you were in the hospital setting or recently discharged or chronic uh, heart failure patients. Uh, the other uh, really important group that was studied and delivered trial is that with other heart failure therapies like beta blockers, RNA, ACE inhibitors, CRT therapy, you do get improvement in ejection fraction in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. So there are patients who kind of get into this no man's land that they started with EF of less than 40%, but now over time their EF has improved. They still have edema, they still have shortness of breath, they still have the syndrome of heart failure, but their EF is 45 or 50%, which is now termed as heart failure with improved ejection fraction. These patients were not included in Emperor Preserve. So if you have a history of documented LDEF of less than 40%, they were not included, whereas in deliver trial, those patients were included. So it really gives us a rich mix of EGFR all the way down to 20, uh, improved EF, recent hospitalization. So all of those data uh, really gives us a, a good idea of how to uh, uh, think about these agents and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So these are the overall results. I mean, I would suggest to you that if uh, I were to take away all the, the, the letters, the words, the numbers from this slide, you would not be able to differentiate which is emperor preserved and which, will, uh, which is delivered. Again, subtle differences in the endpoint definition. Emperor preserved was cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalization, whereas deliver uh, added urgent uh, heart failure visits, emergency room visits, outpatient IV diuretics in their endpoint as well. Uh, both of them were highly statistically significant, p-value of less than 001, but more importantly, highly clinically relevant reductions in outcomes, 21% uh, uh, relative risk reduction in emperor preserved and 18% relative risk reduction in the delivered trial. Uh, the curves started separating early. They continue to separate. And this is a real moment to sort of take a five-second pause and really celebrate this, right? So uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we know that the epidemiology of this disease entity in terms of incidence and prevalence outcomes quality of life outcomes, functional capacity outcomes, hospitalization, mortality, it completely parallels heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. 50% five-year mortality, about 30% one-year mortality after hospitalization, 20-25% uh, uh, one-month readmission rate, so really a high burden, high clinical uh, outcome. But up until now, the guidelines, the only recommendation in the guidelines was treat comorbidities and treat congestion because we had no positive drop. Some trials came close to being positive, some trials were positive in some subgroups, but no trial overall was positive till these two trials came out. So now the guidelines actually specifically give medical recommendations for these patients as well. Neither of the two trials showed any mortality benefit uh, uh, per se for all-cause mortality, but I do want to uh, 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 mention this, that neither of the two trials were designed to look at all-cause mortality, so what do I mean by that? One, patients that come in the clinical trial with HEFPEF tend to have lower mortality rates to begin with. On top of that, a large overlap of these trials were in the COVID era, so already in HEFREF, you have about 80% of the mortality is cardiovascular, whereas in HEFPEF, you have about 60, 65%, 35, 40% is non-cardiovascular. But in these trials, there was a larger proportion of non-cardiovascular mortality in the COVID era as well. And then finally, in order to show mortality benefit, when you have the absolute risk of mortality, which is low, uh, you really need long-term follow-up to see those uh, changes over time. And these trials were not uh, uh, powered or uh, followed long-term for those benefits. The secondary endpoint was uh, uh, recurrent heart failure events, so not just the first, but recurrent heart failure events, so that is shown here. Again, with Emperor Preserve, there was a 27% relative risk reduction. With Deliver, a 21% relative risk reduction. So again, very comprehensive benefits that are seen uh, uh, for heart failure outcomes with these uh, therapies uh, in these trials. So what about some of the other subgroups? So one, uh, sort of the biggest uh, uh, risk, if you may, uh, that we took, and, and, and I'm really glad we all as a, as a community, we did, 
uh, is that Dr. Vidugunathan sort of talked a little bit about the mechanism of action of these drugs. Uh, so while the mechanism of action is, is wide, right, so it has benefits on heart, on vasculature, on kidney, and some systemic effects like inflammation, oxidative stress, uh, uh, autophagy, mitochondrial function. So there's a lot of different effects. So one can explain how these drugs benefit, but the question is actually exactly the opposite. It's not that how do these drugs improve heart failure outcomes. The question actually is, uh, what does any of this have to do with diabetes, right? So yes, uh, these drugs have antihyperglycemic effects. Yes, they were first developed for the management of diabetes, and uh, they are good antidiabetic agents. But when it comes to cardiovascular outcomes, uh, these are truly cardiovascular risk-modifying agents. And indeed, in all four of these trials, uh, Emperor reduced APA HF, Emperor preserved and uh, deliver. Uh, there was no difference in terms of uh, benefit in patients with or without type 2 diabetes. In fact, if you go one step further and you can say, well, you know, there are inaccuracies in diagnosis and, you know, binary di uh, uh, definitions maybe don't make sense. So if you trichotomize it into diabetes, prediabetes, or normal uh, uh, glycemic status, or just take away any categorization and just look at hemoglobin A1C as a straight line from you know, 4.5 to 12. I mean, completely uh, normal glycemic status all the way up to uh, uncontrolled diabetes. No heterogeneity in terms of the benefit uh, for the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalization. So we truly have uh, therapies that are uh, cardiovascular risk-modifying agents. Then some of the other niche groups that I talked about, so we went down all the way to GFR of 20. Uh, no uh, uh, extra adverse effects, including extra adverse effects on renal function were seen in low EGFR patients, and the benefit on EGFR uh, uh, preservation uh, was seen all the way through. What about the other two niche populations or other two specific populations in the liver trial I mentioned? One was uh, hospitalization, recent hospitalization versus more chronic outpatient setting, no heterogeneity, the benefit was seen. And the, the, the real interest group was this heart failure with improved ejection fraction, and again, no heterogeneity seen. So if you have your EF, it has gotten improved but you still have the syndrome of heart failure, signs, symptoms, you met the other eligibility criteria uh, to be enrolled in the trial, even those patients with history of improvement in ejection fraction uh, definitely benefited as well. So pretty uh, comprehensive benefit was seen uh, across. Now, the other things, if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines are really sort of shying away. Now, this comment is more pertinent to heart failure with uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction, uh, then the guidelines are really not emphasizing on, on algorithms, right? Do this first, do this second, wait this long. Uh, part of the reason why uh, we are not emphasizing that algorithm, uh, algorithmic approach is that how can you apply the same algorithm on all patients when not all patients we treat are the same, right? People have congestion, atrial fibrillation, low heart rate, high heart rate, potassium, creatinine, blood pressure, dizziness, you know, lots of other things. So we can sort of fine tune and, and individualize the, the therapy. But the other reason why the guidelines are sort of de-emphasizing this issue of sequencing uh, is that if you think about it, uh, many of us don't realize, you know, we, we appropriately so uh, take care of patients who come into the hospital with myocardial infarction or stroke. We start four or five new medications right in the next two, three days, sort of morning, evening, morning, evening in the hospital setting. If you take all comers, not some subselect group of cardiogenic shocks or balloon pumps or anything like that, if you take all comers, uh, post-MI discharge one-year mortality rates are actually substantially lower than post-heart failure discharge rates. So these are sort of really high-risk patients. And one of the issues with the sequencing business is that not only is it a, a non-biologic sort of a historical construct that ACE inhibitors were tested in the 80s and beta blockers 90s, and it's just sort of history of medicine. There's no biologic reason that you have to prime the heart with this drug first or that drug second. Uh, but that it leads to a lot of inertia and months pass by. So if you look at these trials, I mean, look at when you first had a statistically significant benefit. So what you do is when the trial is ended, your kaplan meier curves are separated. So you go back in time and say, when did that separation reach statistical significance? And if you look at it, it's uh, hovering around two to three weeks' time. In both trials, 
uh, emperor preserved 18 days, delivered 13 days, and if you go back and look at the uh, uh, reduced uh, trials, uh, it was uh, uh, 14 days and uh, uh, 28 days or something like that, but less than one month, definitely less than one month, you're seeing benefits, you're seeing benefit within a matter of weeks. So not only should we be giving these therapies, there's a sense of urgency that the sooner we give the therapies, the better it is. Now, these therapies are incredibly well uh, tolerated uh, overall. The side effect profile uh, in HEFREF was compared by Dr. Vaduganathan. These are the uh, comparable side effects in uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Again, pretty much matched uh, across uh, the, the spectrum. So I will, though, mention is that all the, the risk of uh, ketoacidosis, the risk of hypoglycemia, uh, is incredibly low. Uh, in fact, the risk of ketoacidosis with SGLT2 inhibitors is lower than the risk of angioedema in heart failure patients uh, with ACE inhibitor, right? So we're not, never going to not give ACE inhibitors, uh, but we manage it. But I also don't want to make light of side effects. The reason these trials had such low side effect profile is because these were managed, right? So the patients were given instructions, the clinicians were given instructions. So I, I look forward to, to hearing from Dr. Chang sort of what sort of instructions we should give. But most of these uh, side effects, uh, you can either substantially mitigate or some of that you can completely obliterate and it can go away if we manage the patients uh, appropriately. So here, sort of everything seems to be pretty much uh, mashed. Now, the risk, which is high, is genital mycotic infection. But look at the absolute risk, right? So the relative risk, you can say, is three times higher with SGLT2 inhibitor. But the absolute risk is 0.7 versus 2.2%. So the absolute risk is still 98% of the time, no problem. And when it occurs, you can give topical or oral treatment, and you don't necessarily need to stop the treatment, and you can just continue therapy. I would say that you will see probably one patient in a year uh, where genital mycotic infection is a reason that you cannot give uh, the therapy. So if you have sort of an older uh, woman uh, in, in a nursing home setting, maybe in diaper that gets recurrent genital mycotic infection, well, maybe that person is not eligible uh, to continue the therapy. But by and large, it is very well tolerated. So let's go back to now the second case, which Nigel, just to remind you, 74 years old, hypertension, AFib, CKD, blood pressure 132 uh, over 82. This person has uh, class 2 hef PEF, 54% uh, EF, uh, anti-pro BNP of 960. On torsamide, sacubitril, valsartan, and plerinone. Uh, so this person is already on valsartan and sacubitril, so uh, giving candesartan, which is an, an ARB, this person is already on ARB, it uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, Evabridine, uh, so the shift trial was done in patients with sinus rhythm, not atrial fibrillation, so that's important, and EF less than 35%, not 40% either. So this person has half PEF, has atrial fibrillation, so that will not be an idea, uh, ideal drug. Now, carvedilol is actually an interesting uh, topic because in the new guidelines, in patients with EF greater than 50%, there is a class two recommendation for RNEs and or, or, or ARB if you don't give RNE uh, or MRA, but not beta blocker. And in fact, there is actually a study where beta blocker withdrawal in patients with HEF-PEF, not heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. So obviously these are class one drugs, recommended drugs for HEF-REF, less than 40% class two for 40 to 50%, but over 50%, it is not recommended to give beta blockers for heart failure. And in fact, withdrawal of beta blocker has been shown to improve exercise capacity, probably because uh, of the chronotropic incompetence and lack of exercise induced heart rate going up and, and hemodynamic improvement uh, that we see. So beta blockers should not be given. Having said that, it is not a contraindication in HEFPEF you should not give it just because there is no benefit. But if somebody is post-MI, or if you have some other reason to give beta blockers, then go ahead and give it, but it's not for HEF-PEF per se. Okay, so now I move on to my second presentation, which is on uh, acute heart failure patients. So the first question is, why do we need a trial in acute heart failure? We have these four large trials, two in HEF-REF, two in HEF-PEF, the cumulative evidence of over 20,000 patients 
Uh, the patients who come into the hospital are still heart failure patients. It's the same disease. Do we really need a clinical trial in these patients? And the answer is yes. And the reason it's yes is that usually we did these trials primarily for safety, right? In the acute setting, you're giving IV diuretics, uh, blood pressure, creatinine, this, that, the other, so you want to know the safety. And most of the time, the way these trials are done is that at the time of discharge, you randomize the patient to uh, drug versus placebo. But here, beyond safety, there's actually an efficacy hypothesis as well, and the hypothesis being that we do know that a lot of the patients that get discharged get discharged from the hospital without achieving optimal decongestion. Plenty, plenty of data, uh, breaking phenomena on diuretic resistance, uh, uh, changes in creatinine, a lot of the reasons, uh, you know, the hospital admission is already six days. For whatever reason, clinicians, when we discharge the patient, they're kind of walking around, they're doing okay. Uh, but if they have a swan gans, their wedge pressure is not exactly 14. If their NT-proBNP is drawn, their NT-proBNP is not exactly 400. So these patients still continue to have subclinical congestion. And giving early uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in combination uh, with the usual standard care, uh, it might reduce the risk of diuretic resistance, mainly to better congestion. So the way uh, these trials were done, uh, Soluist trial was done with a, a SGLT1, SGLT2 inhibitor. So this was a combined SGLT1, SGLT2, and impulse trial was with uh, empagliflozin. Impulse trial was a 500 patient trial. This was a trial uh, when we already knew that SGLT2 inhibitors have substantial benefit. Uh, so you have to be a little bit uh, creative because remember, you cannot follow these patients for the next you know, two years for clinical outcomes because this will be deemed unethical. You already have shown benefit for these therapies, so you cannot randomize patients for two or three years and give half the patients placebo. So this was a 500 patient study of about 90 days and uh, led to a creation of an endpoint, a composite endpoint, a wind ratio, which looked at hierarchically whether the person uh, lived or not, if they lived, uh, how many worsening heart failure episodes they had, how quickly they had it, and their quality of life score. So that was sort of the composite that was looked at. The other trial, Soloist, was done a little bit earlier with sotagliflozin. So this trial was a little bit unique. So this was in worsening heart failure patient population, hospitalized or recently discharged. It was only in patients with type 2 diabetes, and this was an SGLT1, SGLT2 combined inhibitor. And pulse trial with empagliflozin enrolled patients, not your shock patient in the emergency room, but you could still be receiving IV diuretic. As far as you're stable, you're not on inotropes, you've been in the hospital for 24 hours, the patients were randomized, you could still be getting IV diuretics. In fact, that was part of the hypothesis to be tested. So the SGLT1, SGLT2, are there any added benefits of SGLT1 inhibitor on top of SGLT2 inhibitor? So that's a real question to which we don't have an answer. In terms of the glycemic control, your gut has SGLT1 receptors, so SGLT2 improves glycemic control primarily by the renal mechanism and stop the reabsorption in the kidney, whereas with SGLT1, SGLT2, you also have gut reabsorption uh, additional mechanism as well. The question is not diabetes control here. The question here is actually cardiovascular benefit, whether SGLT1, SGLT2 combined drugs are better than SGLT2 by themselves. And we don't know the answer. And the reason why we don't know the answer is that, one, we really don't have a head-to-head -head trial. So the only way to really get the answer is to have a head-to-head -head trial. There's no such trial. But the heart failure trial that was being done, as Dr. Vaduganathan mentioned, uh, ran into some issues with logistics and funding and was is stopped early. It was supposed to be a 5,000 plus patient trial long term, was a step at about 1,200 patients. The bottom line is that even one trial which was incomplete and the other trial which was relatively modest size, you already are seeing benefit in the short term. So the primary endpoint in the impulse trial, which was a win ratio, uh, was 1.36. So what does 1.36 mean? It means that patients who were on empagliflozin had a 36% higher chances of winning on that composite endpoint of mortality, recurrent events, time to event, and uh, quality of life scores. And in the soloist, if you look at cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalization, although it was an a, a incomplete trial, you're already seeing a pretty robust 21% relative risk reduction. In the impulse trial, Again, the reason to create the win ratio was because it was a short-term 90-day 500 patient trial only. Uh, 
But even in that situation, the secondary endpoint of all-cause mortality and improvement in uh, heart failure events already has reached statistical significance even in that short-term trial. And the safety profile was no different. The safety was seen across the uh, spectrum of patients as well. What about quality of life improvement? So we know that in chronic heart failure patients, we were already uh, told by Dr. Vaduganathan how these therapies improve uh, quality of life or health status outcomes as well. But, but there are two questions come up with quality of life. One is, are some patients too sick to benefit? So that is that forest plot. So if you take the baseline quality of life scores and divide them into turtles and look at the clinical benefit, no difference. Whether you entered the trial with really poor quality of life scores or really you know, somewhat preserved quality of life scores, all patients benefited with empagliflozin for clinical outcomes. Now let's reverse the question. Once you come into the trial, do you get benefit for quality of life with the use of empagliflozin? And again, remember, I mean, you know, Dr. Vaduganathan was mentioning about three months was the first time. Here we are talking about two weeks. And these patients get a lot of therapies with IV diuretics and other up titration of the medication. And despite that, as short as two weeks, we were already seeing benefits in quality of life with the use of empagliflozin. So not only do we see in chronic heart failure three months, but here we are seeing all the way up at two weeks a significant benefit. So these high-risk group of patients, various different definition, various different ways they have been divided. And pulse was acute heart failure in the hospital setting. The patients could be receiving IV diuretic as well. There are a couple of other trials going on looking at uh, urine output, some mechanistic studies, some more readmission data, and we already talked about solo waste. But the cumulative uh, 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 evidence that we had uh, from Impulse, from Soloist, from the in-hospital cohort of delivered trial, the bottom line is that the class one recommendation by both the European and the American guidelines, that if first, these drugs should be started in the outpatient setting as soon as possible so that you avoid hospitalization. But if somebody is hospitalized, realize what a high risk these patients are at, and there's a class 1C recommendation to start all the drugs in the hospital setting or soon thereafter, and these trials data absolutely support that recommendation. So we'll go to the second case, which is Olivia, a 61-year-old patient who was admitted, history of ischemic cardiomyopathy, diabetes, blood pressure 122, 73, EF of 35, so half ref patient, high anti-pro BNP still, uh, is on an ARB, metoprolol, hydrochlorothiazide, warfarin, furosemide, uh, metformin, alogliptin. And the question is, this person who's at an extraordinarily high risk now because they have decompensated heart failure, 30% one-year mortality risk, what can we do to change the trajectory of the disease? The answer is try to do everything. So yes, uh, we are practicing in U.S. There's a lot of pressures for uh, decreasing the length of stay. And I get that, but that is the, the right answer. A pioneer trial showed significant benefit with the use of valsartan sacubitril. Uh, started in the hospital setting. Impulse trial with empagliflozin, spironolactone is a foundational therapy. And the AFFIRM trial uh, would show that there's substantial reduction in readmission in IV iron, uh, iron deficiency uh, patient with IV iron. So the right answer would be to try to do all of these uh, and either whatever you can achieve in the hospital setting or soon thereafter. So with that said, I will turn it over to Dr. Chang. Excellent. So it's a real pleasure to be here uh, as an endocrinologist speaking to a room of cardiovascular specialists because uh, I think you've heard tonight lots of evidence to support the fact that SGLT2 inhibitors are really not just diabetes medications. And they may have started their life in the diabetes space, but at this point, I've sort of pictured them, they're all grown up now and have made friends elsewhere. So from a cardiovascular perspective, as well as a nephrology perspective, definitely something that all of us need to learn how to give. And this just sort of summarizes for you that the benefits that have been demonstrated in the cardiovascular space are really independent of the diabetes side of things. So then what are some of the barriers then for cardiologists to prescribe SGLT2 inhibitors? And the barriers are listed for you here. But you'll notice at the top one, uh, 
is one that I could help you with, right? The top one is concerns around hypoglycemia or needing to adjust other diabetes medication, which I totally get because these meds were born in the diabetes world. As Javin mentioned earlier, may sort of have that label attached to them, and what you don't want to do is cause harm. So we're definitely going to go over how you can very safely add these medications without any concern about causing harm. And then do you and your colleagues actually feel that you should be prescribing SGLT2 inhibitors? And you can see 66% feel that cardiologists should be prescribing SGLT2 inhibitors for all patients living with heart failure. So clearly something that we all need to get comfortable using. So there is a set of guidelines that I would direct you to look at. We've heard a lot about guidelines tonight, but they all are all from the U.S. And uh, I'm here coming from Canada, so I'm obviously going to plug ones that we just published in August. And it's from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. And it's actually for cardiovascular specialists. And it's looking at SGLT2 inhibitors as well as GLP-1 receptor agonists and how cardiovascular specialists can be using these medications. And for this algorithm, we start off with identifying opportunities where these medications may be in play because of their cardiorenal status. If someone has heart failure or CKD, without doubt they should be placed on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Notice that diabetes, the word diabetes hasn't even shown up in this algorithm yet because we know that SGLT2 inhibitors have a place beyond diabetes. The other opportunity would be for that person with diabetes who also has ASCVD or multiple risk factors. So here, these are individuals that you as cardiovascular specialists will in fact be interacting with, and that individual should be placed on either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor for organ protection. So this entire algorithm is based on the premise of organ protection and not glycemia. And then if somebody then develops, let's say, heart failure or CKD, and they're not on an SGLT2, clearly they need to be placed on one. And then finally, if there's still an A1C aspect that needs to be achieved, then you would add the partner medication, if you will. So this is sort of the summary of our 2022 CCS guidance around the use of these agents for cardiovascular specialists. So when exactly then should you be adding the SGLT2 inhibitor in heart failure treatment, and I think you've heard this loud and clear tonight already, is that my understanding, and I've learned a lot more about heart failure in the last few years than I, than I ever did in residency, is that you have your pillars of treatment, and the idea is to use them all up front and use them all early. And you'll see SGLT2 inhibitors on the bottom, and initiation is day one to seven just as you would with all of your other pillar therapies in heart failure, and then to continue through the journey of that particular patient. But how do you do that safely? And I think this is probably the biggest role that we as endocrinologists have to play in this conference, is to, I guess, provide confidence and comfort for you to be using SGLT2 inhibitors in your population. And the adverse effects shown on the left are not necessarily ones you need to even be thinking about. And I'm gonna walk you through this table. Some of these pertain to those living with diabetes, and many of them do not pertain to those living without diabetes. And the majority of whom you're gonna see that you may be initiating will not actually have diabetes. So if we think about those living with diabetes, then we do need to be thinking about genital mycotic infections, volume-related adverse events, diabetic ketoacidosis, hypoglycemia. Let me speak briefly about the genital mycotic infection part. Very easy. As you're explaining the medication to your patient, I'd like to offer you a medication, in your case, to reduce your risk of other heart failure events. And the way the medication works is that you pee out sugar. And when you pee out sugar, then that's going to relieve the pressure in your heart, relieve the pressure in your kidneys, you're also gonna lower your sugar, but because you're gonna have sugar in the urine, there is a possibility of infection. So all it is is keep the area clean. So if you can make a T-shirt, it would just say pee, rinse, wipe. 
That's pretty much what it boils down to. I realize it's not something we usually talk about, but in the context of SGLT2 inhibitors, we would. Very simple, not difficult, much more so in women than it is in men. And when it comes to men, it's actually the uncircumcised male that could get it, but still low risk, and the circumcised male, not even a concern, because you need something for the P to stick to. So it's really a very simple thing to be discussing. And as mentioned by Dr. Butler, even if it does occur, it's usually a one-off situation, easily treated with over-the-counter or a single pill, and does not recur. So it's not a big deal, but one that we should certainly mention. I'll come back to DKA and hypoglycemia shortly. But what about someone who uh, does not have diabetes and whom you're going to initiate these medications? Is there a potential risk of general mycotic infection? Yes, the risk is considerably lower, though. Because if you think about why it's happening in the first place, it's because you're peeing sugar. But yet, if your blood sugars are normal, you have very little glycosuria. And back to the comment made by Dr. Butler earlier, all of these benefits we're seeing likely has nothing, well, we know has nothing to do with sugar. <laughs> it's, it hurts us to say this, but it's true. And therefore, people without diabetes benefit as well, and the general mycotic infection risk is really very, very low. And then when it comes to things like DKA or hypoglycemia, things that may be a little scary, don't even worry about it at all. None of your patients who do not have diabetes, they're not going to get these. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. And then for all these other things on the bottom, these were things that we were worried about, that we now know we do not need to worry about. So urinary tract infections, turns out it's not increased with SGLT2 inhibitors. Acute kidney injury, in fact, is probably improved, lessened, risk lowered with SGLT2 inhibitors. Amputations, there was a signal with canagliflozin in the CANVAS program, which subsequently was not shown in Credence and not shown in any other SGLT2 inhibitor, and the fracture risk as well. So I think now we're actually more reassured about the adverse event part of things. And you'll notice on the top right of the slide, see downloadable practice aid. As mentioned at the beginning by Dr. Butler, there is a practice aid that you may choose to download, and this would be on there for you. So what about the diuretics? And I think this was touched upon already. Again, very common sense approach. This algorithm is probably more complicated than it even needs to be, but when you look at it, it just makes sense. You're much better at volume status than I am, so you use common sense. If the person is hypovolemic, then you may reduce or stop a diuretic to make room for the SGLT2. If they're hypervolemic, you could probably just add it on top and not worry too much about it. From a blood pressure perspective, if they're hypotensive, then you may reduce a diuretic to make room. And if they're hypertensive, you don't have to worry about it, you can add it on top. So yes, it's a fancy algorithm, but it's also very common sense, so not something that you necessarily have to memorize. What about the EGFR for initiation? So when these drugs were first born, they were born in the diabetes world. We used them for glucose lowering. For the glucose lowering properties of these drugs, you have to have functioning kidneys. You're peeing out sugar. If you don't filter, you're not going to pee it out. That's why this whole GFR thing even came up in the first place, was because we were using it purely for a sugar reason. But nowadays, I would argue that the majority of the time when you're using an SGLT2 inhibitor, it is not for glucose, it is for organ protection. And it turns out for organ protection, the EGFR is not important. So this is a shift from what we had previously been discussing before. So it depends on why you're using the SGLT2 inhibitor. So if you're using it from a HEF-REF perspective, and these are the clinical trial data, as we heard, you can initiate starting at 20 or above for the EGFR and continue down to dialysis, which then also suggests that the mechanism has nothing to probably do with the kidneys even. And I think even the nephrologist might be okay with that statement, just based on what I just said. And then for HEF-PEF, down to 20. This is for initiation and continuation down to dialysis. And then if you're using it for CKD protection, we have data again 20. So the magic number seems to be 20. The product monographs will differ depending on what country you're looking at, specific drug, but if you look at the clinical trial data, 20 seems to be that magic number. And then finally, if you're using it for cardiorenal benefit in diabetes, our clinical trial started at 30. But has that really changed my clinical practice? No. So to me, the magic number is 20. And then finally, if it truly is just for glycemic control, and as I've said earlier, that's very unlikely now, 
It's technically 45, but nowadays that's not the main reason for which we're using these medicines. And in fact, in the CKD world, in the chronic kidney disease world, these drugs are being used independent of diabetes just for those with CKD because we have data from DAPA CKD, we have data fresh off the press from yesterday for Empikidney that have clearly demonstrated organ protection with SGLT2 inhibitor for those with or without diabetes who have chronic kidney disease, now across a spectrum of albumin-creatinine ratios as well, and a spectrum of EGFRs. So definitely grown up, moved out of the diabetes house, and has made friends with the nephrology world and the cardiology world. So what to do about the glucose side of things, because that is a concern. Again, we'll keep it very simple. The only time you need to worry about hypoglycemia is if the patient is taking something that can cause hypoglycemia, because SGLT2 inhibitors by themselves will not cause hypoglycemia. So if the person is taking insulin or a secretagogue, so secretagogue would be your glyburide, glimepiride, glycoside, then there's a risk of hypo. If they're not taking it, don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Just add it on. They're going to be fine. If they are taking insulin or secretagogue, then look at the A1C. And if their A1C is over 8%, you've got a cushion. You've got room. You can safely add the medication. Counsel the patient about what hypo might feel like. If you have hypo, you might want to reduce your secretagogue or call your diabetes team. But that's about it. You don't really have to do anything else. And then if the A1C is under 8%, then that's where you could think a little bit more and either reduce or stop their glycoside or their uh, sulfonylurea or reduce the insulin. Now, if reducing insulin is not something you're comfortable with, that is a very appropriate patient to be sharing with uh, your di the diabetes team colleague and then have the decisions being made together. But if you look at all of the other patients, there's plenty of other patients that fall on the left-hand side of this where you don't even have to be thinking of worrying about hypoglycemia. A word about DKA, because that's been another fear for a lot of people. If you do not have diabetes, do not worry about DKA. You don't even have to mention it, think about it, worry about it. If they do have diabetes, still the majority of time you do not have to worry about it. So these are simple things you can do to not cause DKA in your patient in whom you're starting an SGLT2 inhibitor. First of all, SGLT2 inhibitors do not cause DKA. I'm going to repeat myself. SGLT2 inhibitors do not cause DKA. The only thing that causes DKA is missing insulin, excess glucagon. SGLT2 inhibitors can mask DKA, such that it presents with euglycemia, relatively normal sugars, and then people might miss it. So therefore, if you're going to use it in someone at high risk of DKA, just be careful. So what we'd say is, for now, don't use in type 1 because type 1 clearly is the highest risk of DKA. Now, even that is sort of soft, because I certainly do have patients in my practice where I have, but I think for you as cardiovascular specialists, if they have type 1, just don't go there. If they're on basal bolus insulin, so four injections a day of insulin, they may have type 1. You may want to double check with their provider before adding the SGLT2. If they're on insulin, don't stop their insulin. That's how you get DKA and then remind people not to stop their insulin. And then finally, if they get sick, temporarily stop the SGLT2. Not because it causes DKA, but because when do you get DKA? You get it when you're sick. So then you take away the SGLT2 to minimize the masking. And then on the bottom there, you can see from a surgical perspective what the recommendation is for discontinuation. Temporary discontinuation, once they're eating and drinking, resume the medication. So now let's go back to Olivia. So Olivia, 61-year-old lady, admitted for dyspnea. What if, in the purple, Olivia is on insulin, had CKD, had a history of hypoglycemia, and was cost-sensitive? And you'll notice the difference in her medications here is she's on NPH, 50 units a day. She's still on the metformin, and she has this EGFR of 50 and an elevated uh, UACR. I think in Olivia's case, the need for the SGLT2 inhibitor is apparent for all the reasons other than diabetes. And you recognize that she is on insulin, you recognize she's had hypos, and therefore you may want to tweak that insulin slightly to make room for it, which I think does in fact, does in fact make sense. I think the patient assistance program, not, not practicing in the US, is not something I'm as familiar with, but I imagine that's probably an also should be 
in order to ensure that she can access the various therapies that are required. So great job. Thank you very much for that. So now is the, my, my most favorite part as a moderator that I get to see all the questions, ask, give her all the difficult ones, I just answer all the easy ones. There's a lot of questions here and we have about 10, 12 minutes so we'll go really relatively very fast and see if we can answer as many questions as possible. So first question, you mentioned that there may be an expected fall in the EGFR after the initiation and subsequent recovery. What is expected time course of these changes? Uh, so remember that uh, in the long run, they preserve renal function and there are uh, multiple trials that show beneficial effect on the kidney in the long run. In the short term, when you start the therapy, there's a dip in the EGFR and that dip occur within four weeks. So two, three weeks, you will see that dip. But there's no reason to chase that dip. There's no reason to do some labs or adjust anything or, or something like that, unless and until there's something extreme going on, you know, either some other thing going on, patients is, you know, popping in non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or is on very high doses of diuretics and you're thinking about adjusting diuretic. By and large, in most of the cases, uh, this change is, uh, is, is not clinically consequential and you don't need to worry about that. Why was sodagliflozin not approved by the FDA when it was first presented? So when it was presented, it was for type 1 diabetes. It was not for heart failure. The heart failure study uh, supposedly will be presented in the future. Uh, why do you think dapagliflozin performed better than empagliflozin? Do you think that dapagliflozin is more important, longer half-life? Uh, so I don't think that there is any difference between... Actually, this is a very nuanced question. So, so let me just give a little bit of a 360 answer. So first of all, should we give any drug within a class? So this is a tough question. As clinicians, we would like to say that just give any drug because it makes our life easier. Having said that, over and over again, we have learned that different drugs between the same cl uh, class may have different effects. So for instance, in heart failure, you have bisoprolol, carvedilol, and long-acting metoprolol having shown benefit in heart failure, whereas nabivolol and bisindolol did not. Similarly, in the diabetes world, you have uh, saxagliptin and allo gliptin uh, showing heart failure outcomes going in the wrong direction, but with lenagliptin and uh, uh, cetagliptin, uh, uh, you did not really uh, see much uh, going on. So there is some heterogeneity. So I would say that give those as GLT-2 inhibitors where you have definitive heart failure outcomes data, which is uh, DAPA and uh, EMPA. So now the question is, is there any difference between DAPA and EMPA? So in the HEF-PEF population, as you saw, there was absolutely no difference between the two. In the HEF-REF population, the heart failure hospitalization difference was not, not any different between the two. The only difference was that there was a nominal uh, reduction in mortality, which achieved a p-value of about 17% with DAPA and about 8% with empagliflozin. But the problem is that these two trials were distinctly different when you specifically think about mortality outcomes. Uh, Emperor uh, Reduce uh, was 3,700 patients, DAPA HF was 4,700 patients, so it was a much larger trial, and overall there was about 125 more cardiovascular events. So in uh, Emperor Reduce it was 300 something, and in DAPA HF it was about 500. Also, DAPA-HF had a longer follow-up. So the average follow-up in Emperor Reduce was about 16 months, and DAPA-HF was about 18 months. So you can say, well, I mean, two months, is that a big deal? But you're talking, when you start talking about two months on 4,700 patients on average, you're talking about multiple tens of years of cumulative extra follow-up data. So I think the mortality difference, if we had 1,000 more patients with 100 more events with a longer follow-up, I possibly can imagine, based on the cumulative data that we have, that there is any difference between EMPA and DAPA, and I would use uh, either of the two. Both ESC and AACC guidelines propose SGLT2 inhibitor in a stage A, B with uh, increased risk. How is this increased risk? Uh, uh, defined. Uh, so the increased risk, uh, you know, it was based on two trials. So first of all, a lot of the increased risk we sort of know, right? I mean, hypertension, uh, diabetes, uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial remodeling, all of that kind of stuff. But in the guidelines, when we say about high risk and the use of uh, uh, aggressive risk factor modification and therapy, uh, that was also largely driven uh, by natriuretic peptide from STOP HF and Pontiac. There were two studies, high natriuretic peptide in the absence of heart failure. Uh, that should be given. But that is for multiple risk factor management and disease uh, uh, management programs. When it is specifically comes to SGLT2 inhibitors, 
you, the fact that you have type 2 diabetes, if you have the enrollment characteristics, that's high risk enough. There is no further risk stratification needed if you meet the criteria of the patients enrolled in cardiovascular outcomes trial when type 2 diabetes, uh, that is uh, uh, risk enough. In low-income patients, uh, can you divide 25 milligram pill into two 12 and a half pills? Uh, so... Do I? The answer is yes. Is that allowed in any product monograph anywhere in the world? No. Uh, however, have I ever done that? The, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. How often do you check uh, potassium uh, levels? So remember, if anything, the risk of hyperkalemia goes down with SGLT2 inhibitors, and there is uh, substantial data that is coming out that they, in borderline EGFR or uh, uh, potassium levels, they actually may enable the use of MRA. Uh, so there's no electrolyte issues uh, per se with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. So I would just do what you would normally do in your patients with heart failure. Are SGLT2 inhibitors indicated in chronic heart failure due to severe aortic stenosis? So that's actually a really interesting question. So uh, to my knowledge, there's no data in uh, severe aortic stenosis, but there's a growing interest that when you do TAVR, you know, in the past we used to do surgical uh, aortic valve replacement, but the aortic valve uh, repair replacement procedures have sort of skyrocketed with the use of uh, uh, TAVR. Uh, so uh, the, a lot of those patients develop actually this HEFPEF syndrome post-TAVR. So whether all patients post-TAVR should be given an SGLT2 inhibitor or not is really a question that needs to be answered, but we don't have any data per se, but really important question. Uh, do you think that we will soon see SGLT2 inhibitors in the guidelines for patients with mildly reduced and have PEF? So remember that they are already in the guidelines, but they are class 2A recommended. So they are the highest recommended uh, therapy in heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction and have PEF, a class 2A. So you can challenge me by saying that the first trial ever positive in half PEF, p-value less than 001, uh, 6,000 patient, why would it not be a class 1 recommendation? And the reason for that is that when the guidelines were being written, only Emperor Preserved was out. And the guidelines have these rules that you need to have two trials positive, and the delivered trial was not out yet. So again, I don't know, but I would be uh, very surprised that if in the very near future the guidelines are not updated and it becomes a class one recommendation across the range of ejection fraction. Uh, these drugs now seem to be beneficial in patients with renal insufficiency. Is there any level of renal dysfunction that represents a contraindication for these medications uh, in CHF? I mean, again, I don't know how to answer this question. You know, the, the lower the renal function, the higher the risk, and there is nothing inherent about these drugs uh, that uh, would, will increase the risk. And uh, remember, a lot of the risk with ACE inhibitors and whatnot, actually, when you're on dialysis, you don't worry about those risks as well, and we give it. Uh, having said that, we need to follow the label, and at least in the U.S. label, uh, patients on dialysis, uh, you are not supposed to use it, but they are really high-risk cardiovascular patients. I don't know of any theoretical reason why they may not be beneficial, and I think the issue is we don't know the pharmacokinetics in dialysis patients, and the trial has not been done, but I think exactly like aortic stenosis, that would be a good, good study to do. In patients with recovered EF, do you continue SGLT2 inhibitors? The data from TRED HF uh, uh, did not have SGLT2 inhibitors, so should we not use it uh, if somebody has recovered? So that's an interesting question uh, again. Uh, so TRED HF was a, a small trial where patients did not have some recovery of EF. They didn't go up from you know, uh, uh, 30 to 40 or 45 percent. They completely recovered their EF all the way to normal. Uh, and they were randomized to either stepwise, one by one, withdrawal of some of the standard therapies because the heart failure is cured, or continue the therapy because the heart failure is in remission. Conceptually different thing. It's a remission, continue therapy, heart failure is cured, stop the therapy. And in a very small trial, very fast after the therapies were being withdrawn, uh, the ejection fraction starts coming down and the patients were feeling worse. So the strong recommendation is that you continue therapy lifelong. But yes, the question uh, that is being asked is absolutely correct. There was no data with SGLT2 inhibitor, but there'll be a paper uh, that will be published pretty soon from the deliver trial uh, investigators that those patients that completely recover their EF to greater than 50% are totally normalized. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitor continuation was still uh, associated with improvement in outcome. So the exception that I make 
are those diseases in which with natural history you might find recovery. So, you know, if, if there's a 55-year-old person, 45-year-old person, I think it's pretty much lifelong therapy. But if you have a 21-year-old female with postpartum cardiomyopathy, and we do know that of, uh, many of them will recover, those patients we may not want to give lifelong therapy, and very carefully we might want to cut back. But by and large, it's a lifelong therapy. Can SGLT2 inhibitors be continued during CHF decompensation, or can there be started first line in the acute heart failure? The answer is yes, absolutely to both. So if somebody is on an SGLT2 inhibitor, comes into the hospital with decompensated heart failure, you can just continue it unless, for some reason, they're, go they're going to go through some procedure, they are NPO, you're going to stop their insulin, something else happens, but otherwise. And if somebody is not on an SGLT2 inhibitor, you can start in the hospital setting. Any effects on patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension? So uh, no data in pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, to my knowledge. Post-capillary pulmonary hypertension or secondary to LV dysfunction, uh, there is a very nice study in circulation uh, in patients who happen to have cardiomems device and then were started with SGLT2 inhibitor, and you saw progressively declining PA pressures as well. Does the order of administration uh, matter? Absolutely not. Uh, in HEFREF, there are four therapies. Uh, use your best judgment. But it's better to start all four drugs before you worry about up titration of doses of RAS inhibitor and beta blocker. First, cover all bases before you go up on the day's doses. Uh, then there is a question. Please provide any data on the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors on diastolic filling pressure. So yes, uh, there is a very nice study uh, from our Canadian colleague. So if you have coronary artery disease, hypertension, and, and LVH, there is reduction in LV mass and improved in diastology in that uh, diastolic dysfunction uh, sort of patient population and left atrial uh, improvement as well. Signal for increased amputation, PAD. Worry about SGLT2? Uh, so, in fact, the, the people with the greatest absolute benefit are, are those with peripheral arterial disease because they obviously have very high absolute risk. So uh, if they have an active wound that is actively infected, then I will hold the SGLT2 inhibitor. And once the infection is cleared, even if the wound is healing, I am comfortable resuming the SGLT2 inhibitor. And it's all about proper foot care. That's actually the, probably the, the key message. Treatment uh, in the middle of somebody having a UTI? Uh, well, UTIs are usually short-lived, so usually the treatment is in the matter of days. So you could probably okay to wait a few more days until their UTI is resolved and then initiate, uh, more just because they're already irritated when they pee already, and then now you mention this, they're probably not going to be a fan. So if we're talking about days, I feel like you could wait a few days. So we'll wrap here. There's a question about hypoglycemia, but I assume that was written prior to uh, the detailed description that Dr. Chang already did. And then the last question is about uh, pediatric heart failure and congenital heart disease and different causes, and to my knowledge, there is no, no, no studies uh, per se. So, thank you very much for sticking till the very end. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash EYZ860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Berringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals Incorporated and Eli Lilly and Company.